My lawyer has informed me that we do not stand with cocaine use. Cocaine? Well, I ended up with a burrito and a burrito bowl when I only asked for a burrito. You need yourself a good lawyer. All right, gentlemen, uh, <clears throat> we're gonna start soon, so camera's over here, my camera's over there. Um, we're ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready. Hey everybody, welcome to Schistler Tonight. I got a beautiful show for you tonight and two wonderful guests. We have Evan Patel and Peter Clancy with us tonight. Uh, it's gonna be a beautiful time. We're gonna ask some questions and get us started. So, could you guys give us a quick, uh, a little summary about what uh, Tamanigo Vice 2 Electric Boogaloo is about. Yeah, so it picks up soon after where the first film leaves off. Um, Sully and Blue, which are now our names, we've changed for legal reasons, are still on the prowl for Miami's top criminals. Mm -hmm. um, in this film in particular, we're hunting the elusive dance floor killer, a cartel hitman who does his business under cover of the boogie. So there's a lot of dancing, a lot of action, and a lot of adventure. Tanner, I don't want to overhype this movie, but I will say it's probably the best movie I've ever seen. Yeah, that's quite a statement. We'll have to right. I don't want to. I don't want right. to raise hype around it and set expectations too high. But it is the best film I've ever seen. So I guess this is a question for both of you. Um, but I'd like Evan to respond first. Uh, what was it like getting into character? You obviously had your characters are very different from the way you are in real life. So was there like a process meditation that you did beforehand in order to get the right mindset? As you'll see in the film, uh, Blue is a very nuanced character, yeah. and so trying to get yourself into that mindset of like a multifaceted character like that is very difficult, right. right? And so it was actually so difficult that I decided not to do it at all. Yeah. And so Peter would send me script copies weeks prior to filming, and usually I wouldn't even open them. The world-renowned actor that you guys got to work with, Kevin Dillenberg, um, what was it like working alongside with him and uh, really getting to experience his, his expertise? Obviously, there's a lot of talented people on the set uh, right. when you're filming a movie mm -hmm. of this caliber. But honestly, I thought I was the most talented person on the set. And that's true. I think the actors on this movie are like a pyramid. So like, obviously, I would be the top tier where okay. it's just, there's right. just one. Point. Yeah. And then down here is like Kevin. Wow. And yeah. then Peter and then the rest of the fluff. Okay. So, you know, Kevin, you know, he was always pushing me to be better. Um, and you'll see in his, in his scenes in the Brass Eagle, you see him in the first one, just exuding talent. Was there uh, any ego or overconfidence on set? No, I don't think so. I actually have a special surprise for you two and for our folks back at home. I have two special guests with us today. I have Jacob Stellan, who played Cordaro Diaz in the first movie, along with Jacob Astrup, who played Cuban from the docks. Do you guys want to come out here and say hello? Oh. Nice to see you guys. A pleasure as always. It's been a long time. A pleasure as always. Total pleasure. Mr. Schisler. Thank you, sir. Thank you for coming. Excited to be here. Wow, what a special moment we have. It's incredible to be on the show. So, in the first movie, you both played villains. Was there anything in particular you had to get into that mindset for, or was it you know, anything that affected your personal life when you went home? Sometimes I feel like going day to day, it's always so bland. You have to follow the rules. Yeah. You have to always be so nice. This was such a, a window, a medium, to be something different. And even though I was the villain, I still feel like Cuban from the docks was a great businessman. And he really was a great executor of the day-to-day -day operations of the yeah. cocaine. Anything you've noticed that's been different about the filming of the second one, the atmosphere, the... Great question. In the first one, we were just happy to be filming. It was so new. We were just happy to be there. Right. But the first one was such a success that I think the second one, it changed the whole mentality. The expectation was to be great. So that joy was gone. So now I'd like to talk about the uh, probably the most uh, recognizable scene from the movie, the very end, the, um, the copycat volleyball scene. Oh, of course. Uh, so heartfelt and it's so meaningful. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, how, how, was, how was filming that? How was the process and working with all the guys? Great question. I think a lot of the guys that were on Top Miami Gun Vice 1 are very animalistic in nature. And this was a great way for us to express how much we are like animals yeah. and how we just, we want to express our athleticism. All right, well, thank you for coming. Let's give a big round of applause for Cordaro Diaz and the Cuban from the docks.
Yeah, so I think it's more like, I'd say like this, maybe. And we're back. All right, and uh, word on the street is that there's actually a third movie in the works, kind of? So to wrap up the trilogy about what happens with the cartel, uh, there's actually a third film in the works right now. Um, if I could ask you actually a question, what do you think is the worst crime that a man can commit? Murder? It's worse. A crime of passion. And so that's what Pete and I are going to tackle in the third one, is trying to track down people that are committing crimes of passion. Along the way, I don't want to give any spoilers, but we find out that the person that we're most passionate about is each other. We actually have a uh, quick little question from one of you guys' fans. And we had a little, little eight-year-old boy ask a question. Um, what is the relationship between you two? Purely carnal. Platonic is what the word is. It's not the other one. Yeah. Yeah. Hear that, little boy? Third one's for you. So you guys, you guys have been pumping through these movies uh, pretty quickly. This is the second one in, what, three years, is it? Sorry, I'm totally zoinked. Uh, yeah, we've been challenged by our peers in the industry. They asked, you know, doesn't quality suffer when you make a movie a year? And the answer is yes. Yeah, it's certainly yes. The motto of our production has been um, quantity over quality. Yeah. You actually, you did a lot of green screen stuff, right? Yes, we had a lot of CGI. And wow. you'll actually notice on some of my big dance numbers, uh, I look a little bit different. I got CGI'd in for some of them. Top Maving Advice 2 Electric Boogaloo will be available for audiences December 25th, Christmas Day. So you're not going to want to miss that. This has been it for Schistler tonight. Thank you for coming. And let's give a big round of applause to Peter Evan and send them on their way.